It's a great honor to be your concluding speaker this evening, I must say. I'm here <clears throat> as a cosmologist to talk about the origin of our species, our cosmic past, our cosmic future, and some implications that we can draw from this. The first important event in human history occurred 10 to the minus 35 seconds after the Big Bang. That's when the universe entered a very brief expansion that was faster than the speed of light. This special time, quantum mechanics kicked in, and quantum fluctuations were born in the fabric of space-time. They created small density fluctuations from place to place. Gravity took over, drew matter into the peaks, and the first small proto-galaxies were born. These objects clustered with other proto-galaxies getting larger as the years passed. And finally, we wind up with the mature galaxies like our Milky Way today. We understand this process pretty well. We understand it a lot better than the formation of light. And we can model it in the computer and make videos of it. And that's what I'd like to start with here. This is uh, a computer simulation of our galaxy forming. At about this point, we're about a half a billion years after the Big Bang. The lumps have formed, drawn matter into them. They are coagulating, making ever larger structures. Now, one of the interesting things is as the gas falls in, the gas is the light blue in this video, as it falls in, it, it adopts a swirling pattern, rather like water as it swirls in the sink before it goes down the drain. And those are the spiral galaxies that we see today. As you can see, this is a very, very chaotic process. Uh, Proto-galaxies collided, they destroyed themselves in the process. All the pre-existing stars, which are the little points of light that you see in this video, are thrown into a large halo which surrounds the galaxy. And the net result is uh, a large halo of stars and a constantly reforming disk of gas. Now, we know that this process is correct because we look around us today and we see in the morphologies of galaxies these structures that we see in our calculations. Here are a selection of galaxies, some edge-on like this one, some face-on. In all cases, <coughs> you see these flattened, rotating disks of gas turning into stars and in the case of the last example here, sometimes we see them edge on and we see this characteristic band of opaque dust grains that are produced in supernova explosions. This helps us recognize that our galaxy, just like these, is a flattened rotating spiral. Here's a beautiful picture of the Milky Way. We look out and we see those dust clouds, the band of dust through the plane we recognize a giant spiral galaxy. Further proof can be had from the Hubble Space Telescope. Here is the deepest picture of the universe ever taken, a two-week exposure, a mere $20 million, perhaps the most expensive <laughs> picture ever taken. And uh, we're looking out into space and back in time, and in this picture, 10,000 galaxies in a very small area of sky, we recognize the same sorts of structures that we see in our video simulations. Now, 10,000 galaxies in this little picture, 100 billion galaxies visible across the sky. You're probably thinking that we're pretty small stuff here. Maybe you need a poster like this from the <laughs> Despair Company, right? <laughs> Astronomy, finding out you really just don't matter. <laughs> this would be wrong. This is not my message for you tonight. <laughs> we have to look a little further to understand just how wonderful we are. So let's look at the next chapter. We've made galaxies, they're full of gas, the gas turns into stars. Stars form from dense clusters of gas. And when we look around in neighboring galaxies, we see these glowing regions called H2 regions. A cluster of stars has formed here, and their intense ultraviolet light has gone out into space and caused the gas from which they formed to glow. 
some of the most beautiful pictures taken by Hubble in our galaxy and other galaxies are regions like this. I especially like this next one. Uh, this is my Hubble, my most favorite Hubble picture of all times. A cluster of stars just a few million years old sending out radiation that is impacting gas clouds like Bryce Canyon, uh, a, a rain of photons that's sculpting the gas clouds from which these stars were born. Now, by a stroke of good luck, right in our vicinity is one of these stellar nurseries, and you can even see it with your naked eye. It's the sword here in the region of Orion. With the mystery, the miracle of Hubble, we're able to look at this region at very high resolution, and we can blow it up, zoom in many powers of 10, and as we do so, we begin to discern interesting structures, some bright stars shining there in the upper right. But now at our highest level of magnification, we can see some, some diffuse glowing structures and also some little dark things that look like they're silhouetted against the clouds behind. There are about 50 of these structures in Orion, here is an early phase. These are solar systems that are just forming, making swirling disks of gas and dust around their stars. A little bit later, this is what they look like as they settle down and become more mature. These are inst infant solar systems. There's a star at the middle of each one, a disk of gas, and the dust is opaque. You can see it silhouetted against the clouds behind. We know their disks because sometimes we see them edge on. Here's an example. You can see the star just peeking out above and below the disk of gas. The total size of this structure is something like 17 times the size of Pluto's orbit. That's exactly the size of the comet cloud that surrounds our solar system. So it all hangs together and it makes sense. <laughs> now then. Since we see the evidence of planets forming around us like this, this inspires us to go out and see if we can actually detect some planets directly. And this has been done. It's hard. Planets are small. They don't shine by their own light, and they're, they're, they're tiny and dim. So we have to invent other methods. There are methods, and in fact, the most important one was invented at my observatory, Lick Observatory, just 20 miles away. As a result, of these observations, we've now detected something like a thousand solar systems, a thousand planets around other stars. And something very important has emerged here. These solar systems that we have discovered are not like ours. Some of them are like this one, a giant Jupiter-sized planet just skimming the surface of its parent star. Its year is just a few days long. Others in which the orbits are scrambled, highly eccentric, highly elliptical, interacting with, with one another. Very dangerous condition. The gravity of one planet can force another planet out into interstellar space. Imagine waking up one morning and listening to the news. It says, sorry guys, we have been perturbed by Venus. It got too close in the next two weeks. The temperature will fall below freezing, and in the next two weeks after that, it will be too cold for life here on Earth. Enjoy the last two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I've told you our, the most important chapters in our cosmic history. Uh, let's see if we can draw some lessons from cosmology. Here's lesson number one. We got here according to the laws of physics. There were no miracles. We are subject to those laws and must live within them. This is the end of magical thinking. Lesson number two, our solar system is rare in having planets that are well separated on circular orbits. It's exceptionally dynamically stable and it has a future lifetime of more than a billion years. And finally, the third lesson, the sun has a billion years of useful life remaining. In other words, we have been given the precious gift of cosmic time, and furthermore, we are the first generation of human beings to ever have this knowledge. 
So what is the point? The point is that we are unusual and we are rare. And I think it would be helpful for us to start thinking of our solar system as a cosmic work of art. Great works of art are produced by an exceptional set of circumstances. You need, you need the right technology, you need the right capital, you need the right aesthetic, and of course you need the right artist. In exactly the same way, our solar system is the result of an almost unimaginably improbable set of circumstances. This makes us, just like great art, this makes us rare and precious too. So why am I invoking art here? It's because I want to mobilize your devotion to matters on timescales that are longer than your own human life and longer than the lives of your children or your family. Think how you felt when you heard that the Taliban destroyed those Buddhist statues. You thought, what a pointless act, something that is integral to the heritage of, of, our human, of humanity has been destroyed. That's what I want you to think about the nature and, sit and, and, and existence of our situation here on Earth. Think of ourselves as a great cosmic work of art, the pinnacle of the cosmos. Something, a work of art that has been 14 billion years in creation and is still developing and still coming to even further fruition. All right, now what is the problem? The problem is growth, steady growth. Sounds good, steady, static, predictable. Not so on long time scales. Let's take a modest growth rate, the kind of growth rate that we like to see with our economy, 3.5% per year. Multiply it year after year. In 20 years, whatever it is that's growing at that rate has doubled. Sounds good. You've got twice as much stuff after 20 years. 40 years, you got four times as much stuff, but now you're getting worried. In a human lifetime of 80 years, you've got 16 times as much stuff. And we're just getting started. We haven't even gotten to a cosmic time scale. What's the miracle of compound interest look like on cosmic time, all right? Here's the answer. 3.5% growth every year for a billion years, what happens? That's 10 with 13 million zeros after it. I won't try to read it. We don't have a name for that number. Let's turn the, the, the subject around. Let's invert this. What is sustainable growth on cosmic time? Let's allow ourselves a growth of a factor of two over a billion years. What is the annual growth rate that that amounts to? It's that number, okay? That's so small, I can't read that one either. Effectively, it's zero. So the cosmologist is saying that to be a cosmically successful species here on Earth, we have to adopt to a situation in which we essentially have zero growth. Zero net consumption of resources and perfect recycling. That's what the numbers look like. Now, my concern is, I think that our whole economic system is predicated on growth. Where do you think your pensions are coming from? Where do you think that interest on your bank account is coming from? It all comes from a money system that assumes that there will be more tomorrow than there is today. And the cosmologist in me says, this is impossible. Finally, after 40 years in this field, the cosmologist on the left brain is meeting the citizen on the right brain and they are trying to inhabit the same body and struggling. I don't have an answer, but I'm here to present you all with exactly the same problem. Discuss. <laughs> okay, so I'll leave you with some pictures. Pictures speak a million words. A famous picture, Apollo 17, uh, one of the first pictures that showed the Earth heart-stoppingly beautiful hanging in space in a void. A picture from a greater distance, the moon itself. But this is not 
the most distant picture that's ever been taken of Earth. Let me show that to you. Isn't that a fabulous picture? It's a picture of Saturn. The Cassini mission went out to Saturn and went around to the backside of Saturn and looked back. So the sun is in an eclipse. No human being has ever seen a picture like this before of Saturn. But tonight, it's not a picture of Saturn. It's a picture of Earth. Can you find the Earth? You need a little help. Let me give you some help, OK? The Earth is that little dot that you see right there near the center, the center of this picture. A not insignificant jewel of the cosmos hanging in the void, and the nearest help is very far away. Internalize the beauty of this picture. Think about it every day when the sun comes up, when you look at a butterfly, when you look at your grandchild. Think about our wonderful Earth, the pinnacle of creation that we know of in our universe. So the cosmologist has two pieces of news for you. One piece is bad, the other is good. The bad news is that we are coming to the end of the seemingly endless escalator of growth. We have to get off this escalator and do something different. The good news is that the strategies we'll work out to survive the next 100 or 200 years are exactly the strategies that we need to become one of the few successful, cosmically successful, intelligent species in our galaxy, perhaps even the only one. It's a beautiful world, yeah. It's a beautiful universe, too. Thank you. Thank you.